Hey everyone, welcome back to Premier Study and Investing. Hey, it's so great to have you. Today we're going to be looking at Arbutus Pharmaceutical, Biopharmaceutical, that is, Biopharma Corporation. Basically, the story was I had someone ask me to do a follow-up video. I did one back in here. I basically looked at a lot of different uh, kind of testing or, I say, pandemic plays or, you know, companies in this space. And one that really caught my eye was uh, this company. They have basically patent uh, claims for sure to the Pfizer BioNTech um, technology that's been used for their vaccine. Uh, but they also have some for ties to the technology that's being used by CureVac and also by Moderna. One of the things I like about this company is you can see that even we had a pretty rough November, no problem really, pretty rough January, a decent sell-off in January. And uh, this thing just kind of continues just to stay right in this kind of wedge here. So. Um, we're going to see obviously what happens. What I'm going to try to do is walk you through really quickly what I'm going to do. What I'm, I mean, I'm trying to decide. I do hold this and it's like, you know, how long would it take if we're looking at this um, from a legal perspective, getting a hold of any royalties? I think it's going to be a while. I'm going to tell you this is going to be a long video. The more that we get into it, the more technical it is going to get, the more legalese it's going to get. That's fine. No problem. Um, if you don't know about them already, they basically are focused exclusively on Hep B. So one of the things that's kind of cool about it is that you can get exposure to three different companies running the vaccine, so Moderna, Pfizer, and CureVac. Uh, and then you can also, you know, always have kind of the safety net falling back on their Hep B pipeline. I don't know very much about Hep B. I know a lot of companies are trying to develop some stuff for it, um, and that there's uh, estimated to be a fairly large global opportunity there. But I don't know about their technology. You know, I, and that's not what I'm looking at in this video. So if you want to go look at that, just, they have a newly updated February 2021 corporate presentation. What we know is they have a negative income. They have six million of sales, so they're doing some sales, but just not profitable. 80 employees. Uh, the other things are really this, not a huge short float or short ratio. Insiders own about 1.5%. It's largely owned by institutions, 28.8%. Insider transactions, it looks like the insiders have been selling uh, rather than buying, which is true. I'll go down here and look at this. There's two relevant forecasts, Jeffries and H.C. Wainwright, one at five, the other at 10. Those are both from, say, the last two, two to three months. Uh, the other one goes back to July from, it's from July, so whatever. Um, and then I'll just show you, they have the, uh, when is this from? February, December, and July. Three uh, times, three transactions of sales, right around the $5 mark. Okay, so for people who are on the inside, they seem to think that dumping at five is a good time to dump it. So I'm going to basically grab a bunch of these. This is from IPWatchdog.com. They give us a lot of links, and I'll just basically show you that this is true. Moderna and investors have spent billions of dollars on mRNA research, and Moderna has sought to obtain hundreds of patents in the United States, Europe, Japan, and other jurisdictions to protect that technology. With several hundred patent applications pending, Moderna has at least seven U.S. patents, and it alleges the subject of mRNA, the 12... 73 technology and has numerous patent applications pending including dozens in the united states alone all right so i'll give you the billions of dollars the hundreds of patents globally the seven u.s patents and the dozens pending okay here we go this is from moderna it's their press release invested billions of dollars into the research and development to make mrna technologies a reality now remember they got uh, somewhere around max of 954 i believe million from barda so uh and maybe weren't investing their money, but they were investing money. This is also from Moderna, Moderna's intellectual property. But on here to date, Moderna has been granted more than 240 patents in the United States, Europe, Japan, and other jurisdictions protecting fundamental inventions in the mRNA therapeutic space with several hundred additional patents uh, pending, um, applications pending, covering key advances in the field. Okay, fine. These are the, I don't know if this is a dozen, but this is one, two, three, four, five, six, this is eight. And these are patents in the United States and in foreign jurisdictions. All right, so there's those. And then you need to know the patents pending. This is from the database, uh, March 15th, going back to September 30th of 2021. This is, you can see here, I know it's hard to see, Moderna hits one through 50 out of 88, 88 patents. Okay, so that takes care of that stuff. Now we'll go. So basically it says with all eyes on Moderna over leading progress of its vaccine against the current virus, the company lost an attempt at invalidating a U.S. patent owned by Arbutus Biopharma. U.S. Patent and Trademark Office Administrative Court rejected Moderna's arguments that Arbutus's 069 patent should be revoked because it describes obvious concepts. So this was the case, basically the decision that sent the stock price 
flying up to the seven dollars or whatever that we saw here seven eight maybe as high as nine dollars here so that was the decision happened last was it july so this old information i'm not telling you anything uh you don't know and i'm not really gonna i'm not gonna waste my time with this. so one thing in this article that's i guess nice they have this gentleman shill bashir he is a u.s patent attorney not involved with this case but he made some comments reuter got him to make a comment and the most important thing he says is, but Moderna's effort to invalidate the patent, referring to the 069 patent, suggests that the company, meaning Moderna, sees it as a potential obstacle. At the end of the day, Arbutus might be able to claim a royalty in the vaccine uh, owned by Moderna. Anyways, you have an analyst saying some other stuff, and we, it doesn't really help us that much. I'm going to come back to this article. This is from the New York Law Journal, but you have to register to get it. So you guys see how much I love you. I really I really went out there and gave out my junk email to these guys. So uh, other thing just related, NIH claims joint ownership of Moderna's vaccine. That's because they paid all that money. Um, I think we have it right here. The NIH, blah, 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 blah. BARDA has committed funds up to 940 54 million to accelerate the clinical development and manufacturing process scale up of the mRNA 1273 and blah 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 blah. so that's where the money comes in that's why maybe the NIH feels that they are owed some information now this article is four years old I just want you to see that Forbes ran this in 2016 yes and basically it's the backstory um, what I didn't tell you before but if you went to read those articles it would basically tell you that the whole mix-up came back in 2016 when Moderna, they needed a lipid nanoparticle delivery system. They didn't have the people or the money to basically build it on their own. So they went shopping. They wanted to buy one. There was apparently like about 12 different, uh, 12 is not right. Uh, I think there was three different companies they looked at, Arbutus being one, but they skipped Arbutus and they ended up buying uh, it from Assiduous. The problem was Assiduous didn't own the technology. Um, the they had They had gotten it from Arbutus and basically Moderna tried to, you know, tried to do a workaround, tried to find a workaround and it appears that it, it backfired. And uh, so there's that whole mess. Anyways, I just want to tell you the backstory. Just for funsies, uh, this is from the New York Times, just in general talking for those Moderna folks who may be watching this and trying to understand any impact this may have on them. We have 41 vaccines, testing safety and dosage, phase one, 28 in phase two, 20 in phase three, six authorized, six approved. For abandoned. I just thought that was interesting. It only took a second. So we are here looking at JD Supra. So it's going to start to get more and more uh, legalese and technical the further we go in this. This from November 16th, 2020. It says the vaccine leader Moderna is, quote, not aware of any significant intellectual property impediments in development of its vaccine despite mixed results from PTAP. So, of course, that's what you're going to say as a good PR person. We're not aware of doing anything wrong, right? Okay, so we're just going to have to get, uh, we're going to have to work at this stuff from here on out. It's not going to be easy. This post examines the procedural history and status of those proceedings. They're talking about the PTAB. On July 23rd, the Patent and Appeal Board, PTAB, for the United States Patent and Trademark Office, issued a formal written decision upholding the claims of Arbutus Biopharma Corporation's U.S. patent number 069 from a challenge by Petitioner Moderna Therapeutics Incorporated. The PTAB specifically determined that Moderna failed to show by preponderance of the evidence that claims 1 through 22 of the 69 patent were unpatentable under 35 U.S.C. 103. The 069 patent claims related to, quote, stable nucleic acid lipid particles, they abbreviate as SNALP, comprising a nucleic acid such as one or more interfering RNA, methods of making the SNALP and methods of delivering and or administering the SNALP. They footnote it. Going on, it says Moderna sought to invalidate the 69 patent on two grounds, each of which the PTAB rejected. On the first... I'm going to skip this. This is the third final written decision in a series of IPRs brought by Moderna against Arbutus's patents. And it is also the first final written decision with an entirely negative result for Moderna. Moderna's first IPR ended in success with the PTAB invalidating Arbutus's patent number, they call it the 127 patent. But Moderna's second IPR concluded with mixed results with the PTAB invalidating some of Arbutus's U.S. patent, they're going to call it the 435, and upholding others. So basically what? Arbutus won on the 69. Moderna won on the 127, and then it was a split decision on the 435. All right. 
So what does that mean for future royalties? I have no idea. Let's keep going. Importantly, Arbutus's 127, 4, 35, and 069 patents are similar to the extent that they claim stable nucleic acid lipid particles and methods of delivery. These patents appear to cover liquid nanoparticles. They're going to call it LNP technology, which can be used to deliver messenger RNA to cells. In the past, Moderna has indirectly licensed such LNP technology from Arbutus, but it has recently begun to develop its own proprietary LNP technology. After the PTAB's ruling on the 69 patent, Moderna stated it is, quote, not aware of any significant intellectual property impediments towards products it intends to commercialize, including the mRNA-1273, which is the one they're using for their current vaccine. Indeed, whether Moderna is infringing Arbutus's patents during its development of pandemic vaccines is unknown. But it's worth noting that Arbutus has not brought any patent infringement actions against Moderna. When will they do that? When will they do that? It says the IPRs for the 127, the 435, and the 69 patents have each been appealed to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and Moderna's appeal brief for the case involving the 69 patent is due this month, an event that could be viewed as related to its failed challenge of the 69 patent. Moderna stated last month it will not enforce its basically related patents. Stated last month it will not enforce pandemic related patents against, quote, those making vaccines intended to combat the pandemic while the pandemic continues. However, it remains to be seen whether another company could or would enforce its related patents against Moderna during this pandemic or otherwise. All right, so we're gonna end here on this article from the New York Law Journal, and this is like the mother of all the articles we're looking at. I mean, this is a real humdinger. It says patent issues highlight risk of Moderna's vaccine. Moderna's vaccine represents one of our best hopes for overcoming the pandemic. However, several unresolved patent issues are brewing in the background, underlying the substantial risks and significant potential rewards of Moderna's vaccine. This is from September 14th to 2020. All right, so let's look at this. It says, while Moderna succeeded in invalidating all claims of the 127 patent in view of prior articles, several claims of the 435 patent survived. Yes, we knew that. And Moderna failed to invalidate any of the claims on the 69 patent. We also knew that. So it said Moderna succeeded in invalidating all claims of the 127. Now, if we go down here, however, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit recently vacated and remanded the IPR decision invalidating the 127 patent. That was the one that went in favor of Moderna. And they said that they um, vacated and remanded because the U.S. PTO body overseeing the proceedings was unconstitutional as in constituted. Okay, so what does that mean? They tell us, while this constitutional defect has now been fixed, it is unclear whether the U.S. PTO will reopen the record, allowing Arbutus a further chance to salvage validity. So, meaning potentially, it could be something good for Arbutus. Potentially. They don't know if they're going to reopen it. But if they do, it could be good. Since Arbutus lost, they get another crack at it. Further, due to IPR estoppel, Moderna is now precluded from raising invalidity defenses in subsequent litigation that were or could have been raised with the USPTO 35 USC 315E. The EPRs for the 435 and 69 patents are currently on appeal to the federal circuit. Okay, so again, what basically Moderna is precluded from doing something they would want to, so that's bad for Moderna but also that the IPRs on the mixed conclusion on the 435 and the one that went Arbutus's way are currently on appeal. So that could be appealed. On the merits, Arbutus's patents claim a lipid particle compromising a nucleic acid, a cationic lipid, a non-cationic lipid, and a conjugated lipid, while the broad claims of the 127 patent do not recite relative molar percentages, the narrower claims of the 435 and the 69 patents require specific molar percentages and further require that the non-cationic lipid be a mixture of a phospholipid and cholesterol. Now, there is no way I don't think that any of us are going to be able to sit here as investors and say, I, I have a feeling it's going to go one way or the other. Based on what molar percentages, based on, you know, what are they going to say? Well, what if it wasn't cholesterol? and phospholipid, you know, what if it was, I mean, I'm not that good at chemistry, but what if it was some other kind of lipid, right? I don't know, what would they say? I have no idea. Let's see if they tell us. 
It says based on the protocol. Hold on, hold on. Okay, it says based on the protocol, Moderna submitted for phase one clinical trial that we can see at clinicaltrials.gov. Moderna's vaccine, the mRNA-1273, broadly includes the individual components recited in Arbutus's patent, biological mRNA-1273. says lipid nanoparticle dispersion containing an mRNA that encodes for the perfusion stable spike protein, uh, 2019 NCOV, uh, mRNA-1273 consists of an mRNA drug substance that is manufactured into LNPs composed of the proprietary ionizable lipid SM-102 and three commercially available lipids, which are cholesterol, something called DSPC, and something else called PEG-2000-DM. Don't know what those are. Nevertheless, infringement questions remain. As the broader uh, 127 patent was previously found invalid in view of prior art, and a party cannot infringe an invalid patent. Further, the claims of the 435 and the 069 patents that survived IPR recite specific molar percentages that Moderna's vaccine may not satisfy. So is that the loophole for Moderna? Well, we don't have the, you know, 52% that you guys said in your paperwork on your patents. We're at 57%, you know, could they say that? Would that hold up in court? I guess. Value of vaccine beyond the concern. Oops, hold on. Value of vaccine beyond the concerns about patents owned by third parties, Moderna has contended in SEC filings that its family of mRNA vaccines are covered by its own patents, including the U.S. patent six nine one and six nine two. Moderna's ability to stop competitors from copying its vaccine and profit from its investments largely depend on the enforceability of its patents. Two issues immediately present themselves. It says, for starters, the IPR system Moderna has leveraged against Arbutus can likewise be leveraged against Moderna. Given the financial incentives involved, it is likely Moderna will face one or more IPR challenges to its patents. Which I take to mean, look, if, uh, you know, Arbutus uh, patents 51% molar, and, uh, and then Moderna comes over and says, well, we're going to take 63%, then I could start a company and say, I'm going to take the 41%. And now we all have to have a, a special patent for each percentage. That's how I'm reading it. If you don't agree, let me know what you think, how it reads. Uh, but it goes on here. A successful IPR filing could jeopardize the financial viability of Moderna's vaccine. Moreover, the continued use of IPR proceedings in this fraught climate may allow critics to raise conflict of interest concerns as the same executive branch shepherding Moderna's vaccine through clinical trials and pre-purchasing 100 million doses could be asked to uphold the validity of Moderna's patents and clear away blocking patents owned by Moderna's competitors. So what? It means they basically have friends in government. Um, that's how I read that. Next, when the U.S. government funds private research, the Dal Doyle Act permits the government to demand a license to patents, quote, made from such research, which is March in rights, 35 U.S.C. 203. While the U.S. government has never exercised its March in rights to the extent patents covering Moderna's vaccines were, quote, unquote, made from government grants, Activists may pressure the U.S. government to exercise its march in rights, which could significantly lower the cost to consumers of Moderna's commercially available vaccine. For example, activists from Knowledge Ecology International contend that Moderna's mRNA technology was funded by Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, a government agency, and that Moderna violated the Bail Dole Act by failing to disclose its federal funding in patent filings. As a remedy, the activist requests the U.S. government confiscate Moderna's patent rights. It goes on, assuming Moderna's vaccine receives FDA approval and becomes widely distributed in the United States, it will likely become a target for infringement actions and liability for patent infringement attaches to any entity making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing an infringing product. It also attaches to entities inducing another to infringe and to entities contributing to infringement by supplying material components of the infringing products. 35 USC 271. As such, infringement liability would not be limited to just the vaccine manufacturer, but could also extend to partners such as the U.S. government, distributors, hospitals and clinics, and even healthcare providers. Given the anticipated scale of distribution, the potential patent infringement liability and potential financial rewards accruing to those capturing even a small fraction of such liability are enormous. Now that's probably what you want to hear if you are going to load up on Arbitus.
stock. However, the U.S. government can be sued for patent infringement only in the Court of Federal Claims, 28 U.S.C., 1498. Further, infringement actions against, quote, a contractor, a subcontractor, or any person, firm, or corporation for the government must be filed pursuant to Section 1498 in the Court of Federal Claims. ID Section 1498 actions do not involve a jury, and recovery is limited to money damages providing reasonable and entire compensation. Thus, given the U.S. government's significant involvement in development, purchasing, and distributing Moderna's vaccine, future infringement actions may be funneled to the Court of Federal Claims, where patentees would lose the leverage of potential injunction and recovery would turn on what compensation is reasonable and entire. Assuming an action that does not implicate the U.S. government can be brought, significant hurdles would still remain, as the public will be hostile to actions perceived to impede the efforts to combat the pandemic. Uh, to be blatant money grabs. For example, Labrador Diagnostics, which acquired patents from disgraced testing firm Theranos, sued Biofire Diagnostics for patent infringement in the District of Delaware over Biofire's testing platforms. Shortly thereafter, Biofire disclosed it was working on a basically pandemic test that leveraged the accused testing platform. Public outrage was swift and damning. Within months, Labrador filed a notice of voluntary dismissal, asserting it had, quote, had no prior knowledge, end quote, of Biofire's efforts to develop a test for the current pandemic, and indicating it had offered Biofire some type of royalty-free license. You can see all that here at this other article. Uh, but basically, in view of this cautionary tale, any patentee asserting infringement over Moderna's vaccine could face a swift public backlash. I think that's probably right. Uh, further complicating matters, juries typically decide infringement, validity, and damages in standard non-section 1948 actions, putting the patentee at a significant disadvantage if the public perceives it negatively. But all would not be lost for patentees in such scenarios in SCA hygiene versus quality baby products. 137 CT 954 in 2017, the Supreme Court eliminated the equitable defense of latches in patent cases. While patentees previously put their recovery at risk if they delayed, HC8 hygiene allows patentees to wait patiently for an opportune time to bring suit. Thus, a patentee with a colorable claim of infringement over Moderna's vaccine can bide its time, wait for public sentiment to die down before bringing the suit. In order to maximize the possibility for recovery, a patentee would merely need to give Moderna notice of infringement, which could be achieved with non with a non-public letter. So this looks like it was written. Dorothy Oth is the chair of Intellectual Property Group at Cadwallader, Wickersham and Taft. Michael B. Powell is an associate at the firm. So basically if you're looking for a lawsuit to bring in a bunch of money to a company with a very small micro cap, micro cap, sorry, micro cap company that has a very small market cap, it, it's going to be a long play. They're not going to get this money anytime soon. You're in the middle of a global pandemic. I would say that they haven't sued for royalties and they probably won't for a while. Now, uh, this last weekend, we know that, uh, Johnson & Johnson got EUA approval in the United States from the FDA for their one-shot vaccine. Uh, and we also know that uh, Pfizer vaccine is a lot cheaper. It's m much more affordable. I think it's $10. I'm not sure, but I think I heard it was $10. Whereas I, I heard the folks on the news say that the Moderna vaccine was much more expensive. That's really all I have for you. I'm not going to make a decision. I'm probably going to sit on this information for a few days, mold it over in my mind, decide if I want to add to my position and let it ride. Um, or not. I'll put some um, info at the end of this on recent headlines from Arbitus. And one of the ones at the end is important. They have enough cash at their current cash burn rate to get them through sometime in the middle of 2022. Okay. Well, so I appreciate everyone hanging in here till the end. Uh, if you don't know, I have a Patreon set up. If you'd like to support my work, you certainly can do that. You know, if you're broken in between jobs and you just can't pull that, no problem. Um, just give us a like or drop us a comment, especially uh, tell us how many times you've seen uh, the old Bill Gates uh, today on social media. I'd be very curious. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys later.